Um, I'm gonna go. Ahead. This is continuing the conversation me and Br Tidwell have been having. Um, he made some good points, you know, about the history of how open source and free software and stuff in general had developed. Um, regarding the whole free versus open source thing, um, in an ideal world, we would all be better off if software was entirely free from the cumbersome of licensing and so on and so forth because thanks to things like the DMCA and other various things there are things that make perfect sense to do that technically you can't do and at the end of the day, it makes it really hard to provide good products to the end user, no matter what software developer you are. You know, 321 Studios, you know, for anyone who remembers that back, um, what their software did was provide a graphical user interface for ripping DVDs, and it downloaded this thing that was available free online. And by the way, the end user getting this thing was not illegal. Still isn't. Uh, but them selling software that made use of it was. <laughs> Which is why that software doesn't exist. It's, it's the whole thing makes your head hurt and spin. And we'd be better off without that. The problem is, like all utopian ideals, it requires you to live in a different world than the one we actually live in. The reality is that's not the way the industry works, it's not the way things go. Uh, and there are times open source is actually the worst thing you can possibly do, particularly when it comes to implementation of security or search algorithms or other things like that. There are other times where open source is not only necessary, but really the only way to get anything done. A prime example, the internet. If TC, if the TC IP, let's see, if TCP IP protocol, um, if the email protocol, if HTML, the backbone on which all web pages are built, because even PHP and Ajax um, and ASP.NET pages use an HTML skeleton as their background. If this was not an open language, the internet would not work. I mean, can you imagine having to make, have licensing, you know, for some, for every single, it's like, the internet would not be the free open exchange of ideas and things and stuff. Uh, you know, there's, there's good and bad that comes with that, because email is such an open protocol, we have the flip side, uh, uh, problem, which is spam and spoofing, which makes spam that really can't be blocked, uh, <laughs> and so on and so forth. So as a result, we all get a little spam, no matter how perfect our spam filter is. Uh, but that needs to be an open standard. Um, the idea behind distros like Linux is I mean, between behind an operating system like Linux. And Linux itself is said is not actually an operating system. Linux is the core, and in the case of modern Linux, it is. It's GNU Linux. So there's nothing wrong with calling it that. And like a lot of people insist you call it that, but the short that has been come to accept it is Linux, even though Linux is only the kernel, and a lot of Linux distros get called Linux too. But Linux itself is just the core, and the modern core on which Linux distros are built is the GNU Linux core, which, like he said, is Linux and a GNU wrapper on then which an OS gets built. The actual operating system is the various distros. Ubuntu is an operating system. Madriva is an operating system. I'm not going to name 50 billion distros here, but that's, uh, it's like they're all separate operating systems. And there's many good things that come about that. Um, I'm glad you covered the history because it really shows the thing. It's like for people who don't remember, Apple got started in 1978. You know, modern Apple, GUI computing, in 1983 and 84 is when that really came out. Microsoft started doing that in 1981, and 1985 is when that really started, and it took them about half a decade to really get that developed. So, 
At the end of the day, for this stuff to fully mature, it takes anywhere from 10 to 20 years. It's taken about 10 to 20 years for Linux to really mature so that there are some good, what I would consider, you know, ready for end user consumption operating systems. That does not happen overnight. That's not a revolutionary change. Uh, in some ways, a lot of that development took place faster in Linux operating systems than it did in Windows or OS X because of the benefits of open source, which is, like said, that here's the code. You decide what to do with it. You know, if you want to do it this way, if you want to tweak this this way, if you want to do that, here's the code. Go do it. Um, some open source software is licensed. In which case, yeah, certain Linux distros stay away from it, others embrace it, because as long as it's licensed in a way that allows it to be free to the end user, um, they consider it still in the spirit of open source, which is the source code's available, you can add to it, you can contribute to it, and it's, under, it's released under a general use license to the end user. Even if it is proprietary code, it's still open source and under a general use license. Uh, so, you know, that's neither here nor there. Um, I'm going to do another video here in a second on various distros because a comment has been made which has a perfectly valid argument, but that is a whole other video. Which is, how many Linux distros is too many? And that is a perfectly valid question and argument, but it's not as simple as most people want to make it out to be. So peace out all, I'll see you over there in that video.